Good morning. Welcome to worship on World Communion Sunday as we celebrate our connection to our global family and the ways that Let's try this one. Uh, Angela, could you? <laughs> oh, there we go. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Good morning. Let's try it again. <laughs> Welcome to all of you who are here in person and to those worshiping online. We give thanks for the beauty of this day and an opportunity to open ourselves to the Spirit on this World Communion Sunday. We particularly welcome those of you who may be visiting with us this morning. We pray that this is a time that encourages you in your faith journey. You're invited to fill out one of the welcome cards that we might be in touch with you. They're out on the table as you came in in the entryway. Please fill one out. You can give one to me or to one of the greeters. You'll see there is quite a bit of wonderful bread, a variety of bread, and a few more will be coming as part of our service later. And we don't want it to go to waste. So if you would like to take a loaf home, please do that. Just come up after worship and choose something to take home and enjoy it. So please remember to do that. There are some announcements in your bulletin, uh, but I'll call your attention to a few more items. It is a special joy to welcome back um, Daniel Berkman, who's our Cora player this morning. We're so glad he's here. As you share in the life of our church, most of our announcements are in our Thursday e-news. So if you are not receiving that, you are invited to contact the church office, and we can also mail them to you. Today we are taking one of the four special offerings that is part of the Presbyterian Church USA. Today is the Peace and Global Witness offering, also the Peacemaking offering that funds programs in our country and around the world, and we keep some of it locally to commit ourselves to the work of peace and reconciliation and understanding. There are special envelopes by the offering basket, and you can also give online. It is our joy today to continue with our third adult ed class in our series on wellness, well, well, well taking place in the chapel after refreshments at 11.15. And our own Pat Lindstadt will be leading our class today on aging gracefully, something you're all doing already, but we can learn more about what that means and how we can help each other. This week is Soul Song. That's on Wednesday night at 5.30. And next Sunday is our Blessing of the Pets. So we've been talking about this. There is a flyer out on the table with more details. If you would like to bring your pet or a picture of a pet, you can do that. We are putting together a slideshow of pictures. So if you would like to send in a photograph or send in a, an e-version of a picture of your pet, we're going to have a slideshow. And then a part of the sanctuary will be designated where people will sit with their pets. And then afterwards, we're going to have a blessing of individual pets out on the patio. So 
be ready <laughs> for an interesting and I hope joyful and maybe noisy worship service. Uh, we invite you to bring your friends and family. Uh, this is certainly open to the community. A reminder that in two weeks is our next One World, One Spirit Saturday morning retreat with John Prendergast. Uh, it would be helpful if you would pre-register for that. That's on October 15th from 9.30 to 12. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from John again. He is a very gifted teacher uh, as he invites us to reflect um, together on our how our bodies embody our spiritual life. As we begin our service, I want to call your attention to the stoles that are up on this table. These all belong to me, and I've collected them over the years. Actually, the one on the end was also here at the church. This one is from Mexico, and I ordered it a few years ago. This one is from a friend who is from Ghana, and when Jeffrey and I served a church in the Pocono Mountains. Um, he brought these to us. So I think about our friends from Ghana. These two were woven in Guatemala. And I remember being in Guatemala in some of the um, villages and seeing uh, women doing the weaving. This one is uh, woven by a Hmong artist and a friend from seminary, Sharon Stanley, right after she graduated from SFTS, moved to Fresno and started a refugee ministry for among peoples. And this is part of their fundraising. So I think about her ministry there and the Hmong people who escaped violence. This stole that I'm wearing was woven in Peru, and I bought it at the Stony Point Center in New York which is a place of peacemaking, and it was also a place that missionaries were trained and encouraged in their work around the world. And I'm so glad to see many of you wearing clothing from around the world today as we think about our global family. So let us join now. Uh, Martha's going to lead us in our opening song.
Just come right up here and face the congregation. Thank you. Julietta, you have a loaf of sourdough. We place this loaf, one of the oldest types of bread, originally from Egypt. It was brought to San Francisco during the gold rush. A sourdough starter must be fed and shared. This bread has lessons to teach us. Would you come up here and put it on the table? Right there. Thank you. And what's your name? MJ? MJ, we're glad you're here this morning, and you brought challah bread. We place this challah loaf as we give thanks for our Jewish brothers and sisters. Challah is usually braided and typically eaten on occasions such as Shabbat and major Jewish holidays. It is made of dough from which a small portion has been set aside as an offering. We remember Jesus, who was Jewish, and broke bread with his friends around the table. Would you put that right up there, right between there, right there? Thank you. Good morning. And what's your name? Ava. We're glad you're here. Ava, you're bringing a tortilla. We place a tortilla in honor of the people of Mexico. Guatemala, Honduras, and other Latin American countries. We thank you, God, for the rich cultures of the people, for the ways you can, we can celebrate a heritage from the Mayans and the Incas. Would you put your tortilla on the table? Thank you. Elizabeth, you have brought naan. We place this naan bread in honor of the people of India. We pray for the work of God's spirit to strengthen the, tra the traditions of peace. Go ahead. Put it up there. And Barbara, you brought pita bread. We place this pita bread in honor of the people of Greece, Saudi Arabia, Lebanon, and other countries in the Middle East. We pray for the work of the Spirit to bring peace to all people. Thank you very much. And are the children going downstairs now? Very good. All right. You may go to your seats, and then after the choir sings, you will go down, you may go down to your class.
Moses, the prophet Isaiah. Listen for these words, and the children are invited to go down. Thank you again for bringing up the bread. Listen for these words from the prophet who speaks for God about who is invited and welcome. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Holy One to minister to this one, to love my holy name and to be servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it and hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted upon my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. And reading from the New Testament, from Matthew's Gospel, a verse from what we often call the Sermon on the Mount, or Sermon on the Mountain, ways that Jesus is inviting his followers to live into the kingdom of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Let us pause for a moment of prayer. Holy One, we hear these ancient words as you call all people, as you are the ground that we stand with all people. Open us to your spirit. As we hear and reflect on these ancient words, may we be open to you as we are continually transformed. Amen. I want you to think about who reads the maps in your family. Maybe think about growing up or in your adult life. Do you have memories of vacations and who had the map unfolded in the front seat and one person is driving and somebody else is navigating to find the best route. When Jeffrey and I had been serving a church in Wausau, Wisconsin, and then were called to serve a new church in Elk Grove, California, south of Sacramento, in 1995, we drove from Wisconsin to California. Our older son Jackson was 10 months old. It was a long trip. <laughs> but we wanted to see friends along the way. So we had maps that were going to take us from Wisconsin through Iowa and Nebraska through Colorado and Utah and Nevada. And part of what I remember is obviously maps don't tell you how long it's going to take you to get from here to there or the distance to, ne to the next gas station. AAA has some of that information. But this was obviously long before GPS and Google Maps and all the things we have now. We just had the maps. And one thing you should know about me is I love maps. <laughs> I like seeing the whole big picture, not just the next turn. I want to see where the roads connect, what the options are. And I might have gotten this love of maps from my dad. 
he, I grew up in Southern California in Orange County, and I remember my dad having those Thomas guides, those spiral-bound maps. Now, he drove a lot for his work, and both in Los Angeles County and Orange County, and a lot of those freeway systems he had in his head but he also liked to check on the map what was the best route if you were going to be in Corona and then you were coming back in Riverside County. But I also remember not only was he a great navigator and map reader, but because he was a civil engineer and he kind of knew how towns and roads were put together. And we would be going somewhere on a vacation to a town we'd never been in before, and we knew we were basically on the right path, but maybe we were looking for some point of interest. And he would say, it just feels right. <laughs> like, I think, I know we're on the right road. It just feels right. So he had that intuition as well as being a good map reader. So maps help us know how to get somewhere where we are in relationship to something else. But they can also shape the way we see our neighborhood, our community, our country, our world, even the cosmos. What I realized looking back is that one thing I assumed about maps is that they were always factual that they were non-biased documents about the layout of a town, or a county, or a state, or countries. And I came to realize that that is not always true. Maps can be political documents. It depends who's making the map and who it's for. Maps can reflect or change our perception in some comical ways and some very serious ways. Maps can shape our perceptions of who we are and how we see the world. I came across this map a few years ago. This is by Saul Steinberg. It's a view of the United States from Manhattan. <laughs> so the things that matter, if you live in New York, you see 10th Avenue, the Hudson River, a little bit of New Jersey, and then kind of the rest. <laughs> There's Los Angeles, Las Vegas, and the Pacific Ocean. I'm guessing that feels fairly accurate to many people who live in New York. Now here's a map of how some Californians see the rest of the United States. North of us, basically coffee. <laughs> Over there, Canada, Vegas, and around there somewhere. Cowboys and pickup trucks down. There's a big part of just the south. Old people in Florida. <laughs> Loud and obnoxious New Yorkers. Now, I'm sure most of you don't think these things. But I admit there's probably been times that's kind of how I saw the world. And then there are world maps. And the mo more we learn, the more there is to learn about how maps have changed and borders have changed. And we begin to see that what we look at at maps and nations and people are from a particular perspective and how that might change as we deepen our connection to the Holy One and all creation. This is a map that really changed my perspective. It's called the Peter's Projection Map. This map shows all the areas, whether countries, continents, or oceans, according to their actual size. All the north and south lines run vertically on this map, so the geographic points can be seen in their correct geographical relationship. By setting forth all the countries in their true size and location, 
the Peters projection map allows each one in its actual position in the world. In this complex and interdependent world, people should have their place accurately portrayed. This map is also called the Gall-Peters projection, and it was initially presented by Gall in 1855. But it didn't really achieve great attention until Arno Peters reintroduced it in 1973. He promoted it as a superior alternative to the commonly used Mercator projection. On the basis that the Mercator projection, the one we're probably more familiar with, greatly distorts the relative sizes of regions on the map. And in particular, he criticized that the Mercator projection causes wealthy European and Europe and North America to appear very large relative to poorer Africa and South America. He said, this is more accurate. The size of Africa is astonishing. And he was so persuas persuasive in 1973 that many socially concerned groups adopted this Peters projection map, including the National Council of Churches. And said, this is the map that shows us more clearly who we are as a world. Now look at this map. Now some of us would say, well, that map's upside down. But Think again, can a map of the world really be upside down? We know the world can't be upside down because there's no up in space. It depends from where you are looking. We get used to seeing North America and the United States in the center, at the top, but this map is just as accurate. The map is just another way of picturing the world. It's just as real as any other map. And it reminds us that maps, in some ways, are inventions and are a result and subject to assumptions and beliefs and who's in power. We know that making a flat map of a round planet is hard, and so there's always going to be some distortion. But it matters how the continents are placed and how we are looking at the world. What if we look at the world from other perspectives? What do we learn about ourselves and the global family? And as we hear words of the prophet like Isaiah, words of Jesus, of early followers of Jesus' ways, how might our inner maps change? On this World Communion and Peacemaking Sunday, what might that mean? The passage I read from Isaiah is Isaiah chapter 56, really shifts part of the narrative of Isaiah and expands the boundaries of who is included in God's people. It was written at a later stage of development in the writing of the book of Isaiah, and it brings together perspectives about human action and divine action. And there was a lot of disagreement about how the post-exilic Jewish people, they've been in exile in Babylon, God has brought them home to Jerusalem. Who are they now, and how are they going to be a people? Isaiah 56 is part of this long book of Isaiah that's called the third Isaiah, the third section. 
And this book makes it very clear that there's something important about divine action and human action. On one hand, God works for good in the world, even when humans fail to do that. God has delivered the exiles from Babylon despite their moral shortcomings. And there's an expectation now that the people will respond to God's graciousness by acting in ways that protect the vulnerable. But what's interesting as the Judean exiles began coming back to Jerusalem in the late 5th century BC, the boundaries of the worshiping community had to be renegotiated. The temple's been rebuilt. Who can come to the temple? In some ways, the Jewish community said, we need to keep our people close. We need to start reproducing. We want our tribe to grow. But this chapter in Isaiah suggests that God's vision of a broader welcoming was part of the narrative and important. There were two classes of people that had been excluded from the temple, eunuchs and foreigners. And here God is saying to the people, foreigners are now welcome. In fact, they don't even have to come to the temple. They may worship on my holy mountain and together enjoy. They will be part of God's people. In the final verse in that section, God promises to bring these new people into the community. So this paradox of being a people but also open to more is part of the biblical story. I read a verse from the Sermon on the Mount, the teachings of Jesus about lifting up the poor and pursuing peace, shalom, for all people, everyone who is about the work of shalom shall be called the children of God. There wasn't a circle, a boundary around that. All those who work and live for shalom are part of the children of God. When Jesus has a long conversation with the Samaritan woman at the well, Samaritans were the enemy. Jesus, by his actions and words, says those lines are porous. There's more welcome than you knew. And although, although there is clearly tribalism in the biblical narrative, there is this other thread that the Holy One keeps expanding the boundaries, addressing stereotypes, calling people to rethink who is the insider. And who is the outsider? Who's considered clean and unclean? Who's acceptable to God? And who is not? And how those boundaries keep shifting. All are welcome at the table. Change your maps if they are keeping you from experiencing abundance, abundant grace. I want to close with a story that comes from World War II. In Normandy, during World War II, there were two GIs who had a comrade who died in battle. And they felt it would be important to bury him in a cemetery, and they had seen one close by. They knew their comrade was Christian, so they went to the cemetery and asked the Catholic priest there for permission to bury him inside the fence of the cemetery. The priest said, well, the rule is you have to be Catholic to be buried here, and you'd have to assure me that you knew that your comrade was Catholic, and you really need to be a member of this parish, so I'm sorry, I just, I can't allow it. I, I wish that I could, 
but I can't. And they tried one more time, please, it would just, it would mean so much to us if we could, if we could bury our friend here in the cemetery, inside the fence. No, I'm sorry, the priest said, I, I just can't allow it. That's the rule. But I suppose you could, you could dig a grave right outside the fence. You could, you could bury him there. So the two GIs reluctantly dug the grave and said a prayer and buried their comrade. They finished after nightfall, and the next morning, the entire unit was ordered to move on. And the unit, the men said, we just need to say goodbye one more time. So they raced back to the little church and to the cemetery for one final goodbye to their friend. And when they arrived, they, they couldn't find the grave site. They thought they remembered where they had dug it, and they, they walked around the fence, and then they went one more time, and they could not find where they had dug the grave. And they, they knew they had dug it, and they just couldn't find it. So they went to see the priest and said, um, excuse us, Father, we, we were the ones who came yesterday, and we're sorry to bother you, but we asked permission to bury our comrade inside the fence in the cemetery, and you said bury him outside, and, and we did. And and we left, but now we can't find the grave. Do you, do you know what happened to it? The priest said, oh, yes, I, I know what happened. I was so upset about your visit yesterday that I spent half the night worrying about what I said. And I spent the other half the night moving the fence. The Holy One moves fences and colors outside the lines, and invites all to the table. May we be willing to move fences. May we be people who seek shalom and peace, and may we be willing to change our maps. Amen.
As we share in our life together, are there joys and concerns we would like to lift up today? I would just like to thank my extra singer today, Ken Putnam, who stepped in to sing bass kind of at the last minute, a wonderful member of Consort Chorale. Thank you, Ken. Great. Any other joys and concerns to share today? I would just like to say thank you to my sister and my sister-in-law and my niece and nephew is downstairs for traveling almost seven, six, seven hours by flight with two kids just to come and check on me. <laughs> Welcome. It means a lot. We're so glad you're here. We're so grateful Chitoka and Barbara are part of our family. I would just like to celebrate that I see, I'm not going to say an old friend, I'm going to say a long time friend of this congregation here today, Bev Stevens. It's wonderful to see you today. <laughs> Welcome back, Bev. I want to mention um, prayers of gratitude for so many who are helping in Florida and I'm sure also in the Carolinas and Georgia. My brothers live there and they're well and safe and I'm so grateful, but of course so many are not. And the images of people helping is just heartwarming. Thank you. We do need to give thanks for all those who are helping and those who are on their way. Good morning. My name is Rebecca, and I just want to thank everyone for all their thoughts and prayers and support during the last few weeks, which have been difficult. And uh, I really, really felt your support. Um, just so that some of you don't, may, may not know, and you might learn from my experience. Um, this is my husband's and our and my uh, seventh year on our journey with Alzheimer's. And about a year and a half ago, I had him transferred to Drake Terrace because I could no longer give him the care that he needed. And he was doing very well there and was happy, and I was happy too. But then on August 2nd, he uh, was tested positive for COVID, and Alzheimer's and COVID are very bad combinations. So he spent 
three weeks in the hospital, and um, sadly, I learned that Drake Terrace would not take him back, which surprised me. And, um, but with the help of the doctor in the hospital, uh, wind chimes accepted him, and he's now there, uh, very comfortable with hospice care, and um, uh, everything is stable now, and it's good to be back here. But as it turns out, you should know, it's really not uncommon for communities to refuse you if they can no longer take care of you. Mm. So make sure if you have to put a loved one in a community that you ask a lot of questions. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. We're glad to see you and continuing prayers for you and Sam. Let us remember today that we bring offerings of who we are and the gifts that we have and the way we share our time and energy and money to share in the work of this church that we might be a source of hope and shalom and justice and peace. And in addition to our regular offerings today, you're invited to participate in the Peace and Global Witness offering. As I said, there are envelopes at the back for both the regular offering and special offering, as well as you may give online or mail a check to the church. And now let us turn as we come to the table. On this World Communion Sunday, we are invited to acknowledge that we live within national borders. That includes many sovereign nations. That people of faiths sometimes are not protected of different faiths. And that shapers of traditions and languages are often not valued and respected. And as we continue to learn more about our own history, we continue to grow and change our maps. And people will come from east and west and north and south and come sit at table in the kingdom of God. And we gather today at this table as we think about people in our own country and around the world that we gather today with indigenous and settler people in many lands around the world to receive a communion that is not of our own making, but of God's. Today, we celebrate all the world far away and near at hand, remembering with the prophet Isaiah, lift up your eyes and look around. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons and daughters shall come from far away. And as one writer reminded me, we remember that Sage and cedar, sweet grass are holy, and dance is holy, and the four directions are holy. And we remember Jesus of Nazareth called his disciples to name as holy the most common food and the most common drink, and in remembrance of him in life, in death, in resurrection, we come to this table. Holy One, we ask that you bless the meeting 
of hunger and generosity in all places. Bless the memories of all that is holy land, the place of Jesus' lineage and Passover custom, the land under our feet, all land remembered and honored. Bless all that is communion, but especially what we take into body and spirit so that you can live and walk and sit and move with us, among us, within us. We give thanks for the joys in life. We pray for all that breaks our hearts. We pray for the burdens of our, that we carry and for each other. We pray for peace. Today we particularly pray for those in Florida and South Carolina and Cuba and Puerto Rico and these places that have been devastated by Hurricane Ivan. And we give thanks for those who are helping Hear us as we pray a prayer that Jesus prayed. We pray in the ways that reflect our own deep connection to you and one another in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, Mother, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The bread on this table, blessed and broken, it comes from around the world. And as long as this table is open to all, it is holy. Sharing this love from this table, we will never be hungry. The cup on this table was blessed and poured like overflowing tears and joy that we might drink deeply and not be thirsty. When Jesus was gathered with his friends and followers, he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my life given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and blessed it and said, This cup is the cup of salvation poured out for the reconciliation of the whole world. Whenever you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. And today, we are going to invite you to come forward, and we are going to hold the elements up front. We will be wearing our masks, and you are invited to pick up a piece of bread or gluten-free cracker and a cup and return to your seat to eat or drink. And after the line has finished, if you would like us to come to you, we are glad to serve you at your seat.
that you have refreshed us at your table. Strengthen our faith. Increase our love for one another. Unite us in the mystery of everlasting life. May we go out into the world to plant seeds of justice, transformation, and hope. Amen. Let us join in singing our closing song. This comes to us from some of the African countries, and it was originally written in the language of Zulu. And maybe I'll stand up here with Martha and help lead it. this day, knowing that we are beloved, that we are part of a global family, and we take that hope and love into the world. Amen.